this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning, dearly beloved, for the saints of Mount Zion Fellowship Church at home and abroad. You will know the truth. And the truth shall set you free. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, O Lord, for counting us among the living and giving us the privilege tonight to some to come together this afternoon to fellowship and hear thy word. We beseech thee, Father, to anoint your message and the tongue of your servant that will deliver it. Father, please consecrate all the hearts that be hearing your message and let your message be a blessing to their spirit. This morning, Father, I lift up all those who have rejected the truth of your word and are seeking after the humanistic ways of the world. Lord, I know that Satan is the father of lies and his great desire is to lead many away from the path of truth in Christ Jesus. I ask, Lord, that you would thwart his malicious plan and use the satanic agenda and the humanistic lies that are hurting so many people to be the very instrument that will cause many to question the values that they have held there and to turn them from their worldly ways and seek the Lord Jesus where he may be found. For he is the one <clears throat> and only truth and he is the way and the life and the light and he is the only hope for mankind. Raise up, I pray, and I'm your prayer warriors, that we be prepared to seek your face and to stand in the gap for those that have been swept away into the lies of the humanistic agenda. May the truth of your word become a beacon of light to those that are in need of a savior. And I pray that the lies of the enemy will be exposed so that many that are heading for an eternity of separation from the Father may be swept into the kingdom of his dear Son. To your praise and glory, your word is truth. May the truth of your word ring in the ears of all who are perishing and bring many perishing people to salvation. At the end of this message, O oh Lord, let your truth set us free and we may go to our respective homes with praise and thanksgiving in our lips. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. When we were reciting our mantra this morning, when we skip that part of the core principle of our church on compromise, I was suddenly jolted back into my spiritual consciousness and I started meditating. about each testament we are consciously pronouncing. What do they really mean? Do we really understand what we are reciting? We are practicing Christians, we say. So we start with, we are Mount Zion. And what does that mean? It means we are identifying ourselves individually to every sentence we are pronouncing, we are committing ourselves. We are Mount Zion. We are practicing Christians. In other words, we are faith-based, living on the core principles laid out by Christ. Servant leadership, sacrifice, diligence. We are perfectly united, always in one accord in thought, through the invisible cord that binds us together in love, sharing fellowship, being there for one another and thanking God for one another and praying for one another. We are uncompromising. We stand on the truth and we never compromise the gospel of Jesus Christ no matter the price. And we are moving forward. The Lord said, 
that anyone after following me and still looking back is not fit for the kingdom of heaven. But I thank God that we have resolved not to look back. What do we have in the world today within the Christendom? Satan has invaded the flocks of Christ and planted within the fold false prophets and false pastors. The spirit of lies have invaded and corrupted the fiery pillars of our faith. That even the elects are afraid of losing their status quo. They have compromised their moral virtues, their moral values, and the core values of the church. And no wonder. My general Vasya was asking me in my dream, Pastor Lambo, what do you mean? Or how do you understand moral principles? He sat me down and explained to me. And today, on the increase of false prophets, um, almost 85% of evangelical pastors trading with the name of our Lord, using his name to deceive the flock of Christ. So much so that the truth has become a delicate thing to tell without fear of being persecuted or excommunicated from your circle of privileged prophets of God. But our Lord knew that the time like this will come. And he warned us in Matthew 7, 15. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing. But inwardly they are ravaging wolves. And we also read in Isaiah 30, 10 to 40. They say to the seers, don't see visions. And to the prophets, don't give us visions of what is right. Instead, tell us. Welcome things. Prophesy. Illusions. Get out of the way. Turn aside from the path and stop confronting us with the Holy One of Israel. Therefore, this is what the Holy One of Israel says. Because you reject this message, and put your trust in oppression and enjoy it. And since you rely on it, therefore, for you, this sin will become like a bridge in a high wall that is about to collapse, bulging out, and whose crash comes suddenly in an instant. Its breaking will be like when potter's vessels are broken, shattered, so ruthlessly that among its fragments, not even a broken silver, we be found for taking fire from a heat or scooping water out of a system. But we thank God in Mount Zion today, Fellowship Church, that we never compromise and we follow what we teach. As we have already read in, and prayed on Hebrew 3 13 to 15, instead, continue to encourage one another. Every day, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin, because we are Messiah's partners only if we hold on to our original confidence to the end. As it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as they did when they provoked me. In Mount Zion Fellowship Church, we speak the truth according to what the Bible instructed us in Ephesians 4.15. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ Jesus. And what is truth? What is truth? When our Lord Jesus Christ was brought before Pontius Pilate, he asked Jesus. In John 18, 36 to 38, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should be not delivered to the Jews, but now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? And Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. 
For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. So I read this. I asked myself, what is truth? I had no answer. So I approached my general overseer, thank God, I had a relationship with him. I asked him, my overseer, what is truth? Because why did Jesus Christ refuse to tell Pontius Pilate when Pontius Pilate asked him, what is truth? And Jesus was just looking at him. My general overseer said, the truth was also staring on the face of Pilate. I said, uh-uh. When is my general Bazaar started talking in parables? Is he also Jesus Christ? Talking in parables? He said, oh, telling me the answer. I said, the school was also staring me in the face. Ah, I said, okay. So I went back home. I started thinking, what is true? I never knew that the truth was standing between me and my general Bazaar when I was asking him, what is truth? And he shall know the truth. And the truth shall set you free. Every time we pray, we always remind ourselves that anyone who worships God must worship him in spirit and truth. Pontius Pilate, a pagan the governor, was also curious to know the truth, but the truth was denied to him as well as to the religious leaders who brought Jesus to him to be tried for sedition. Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2, 79, But we speak the wisdom of God in a misery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. If the religious leaders and the wise had known the truth, they would not have crucified Jesus. God <coughs> made foolish the wisdom of the wise so that we may have redemption from sin. What then is truth? According to the master, truth is the only one thing that changes not. In the entire world, there are two things. The one is truth, and the other falsehood. Truth is that which is and falsehood, that which seems to be. Now, truth is anything which has no cause, and yet is the cause of everything. And falsehood is nothing, and yet is the imagination of anything which is the truth. The holy breath is truth. It is that which was, and is, and evermore and shall be for everlasting to everlasting. If the holy breath is truth, then what is the holy breath? He is the spirit in us, which is Jesus Christ. Our Lord Jesus Christ, knowing the truth to be himself, does advise all who believe in him and wish to follow him as we read in John 4, 23 to 24, but the hour is coming. And now is when the true worshipers we worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him 
in spirit and truth. Thank you, Pastor Minor, for telling me the truth. Truth, therefore, being the Christ in us, can manifest himself in many ways in our life. Before we can fully understand truth, let us see what the scriptures had to say about truth. One, in Deuteronomy 32, 4, he is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are justice, a God of truth and without injustice, righteous and upright is he, meaning a faithful God who does no wrong, upright and just. And in Exodus 18.21, Jethro, the father-in-law of Moses, advised him in the administration of the large number of the children of Israel, in the wilderness. He said, moreover, you shall select from all the people of able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. Here, the Bible clearly gives us an insight about the attributes of God. To be able to worship God, we must also endeavor to possess those attributes which are in Christ Jesus. And what are these attributes? A just and faithful God who never breaks his promise and righteous and merciful to all those who fear him and who put their trust in him. Now, King David, <clears throat> despite his turbulent life, he walked before God in spirit and in truth. That he earned the compliment of God to call him a man after God's own heart. When King David advanced in age, like what many righteous fathers would do, they would call their sons, and the son to whom they would like to hand over the heritage. What do we have in the world today? Many fathers. That's why the fact that they have reached advanced age, we still be fighting death and never get the chance or the time to worship or the wisdom to give their ears the last word which David gave to his son King Solomon in 1 Kings 2.4, that the Lord may fulfill his word which he spoke concerning me, saying, If your sons take heed to their way, to walk before me in truth with all their heart and with all their soul, he said, You shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. King David was righteous and just, while King Solomon too was wise and upright. But we still see a lot of lessons to learn from their lives and also about God, who nobody can predict or query how he directs the affairs of men. When we start comparing the reign of King David, who was righteous before God, and King Solomon the wise, who also walked before God in truth and righteousness, even though towards the end of his life he yielded to the flesh and forsake God to worship the idols of his wives. We will be in a better position to know some of the truth about our God. Now, the baffling question is this. Shouldn't obedience alone to God lead us to a pain-free and prosperous life? What are we asking is this. Is it not an absolute guarantee that if you obey God and keep all the commandments and live a faithful and righteous life, we shall live a life free of pain, free of anxiety, and complete peace? King David advised his son, Solomon, to be strong and prove himself to be a man and observe what the Lord requires. 
walk in his ways and keep his decrees and commands, his laws and requirements as written in the law of Moses, so that he may prosper in all that he does. When we look into the history of the children of Israel, we will see how God has set up a class system for his chosen nation of Israel. Obedience yields blessing, while disobedience yields pain. And this pattern is evident in the experience of the life of the children of Israel. When they obey God, they prospered. And when they disobey God, they suffered. However, when Israel did not fully obey or fully disobey, the pattern was less clear. Nobody understood it. For example, while David was a righteous king, his reign was never problem free. Unlike David, Israel was blessed, but still experienced some hardships. When we consider King Solomon's reign, Israel experienced unparalleled peace and prosperity, yet Solomon's sins led to a divided kingdom in his son's era. All of this leads us to wonder if Israel was faithful to God. Should God not have made the lives of Israelites easy? And if we faithfully follow God, should he not have made our lives easy? One mysterious thing is what God promises in large abundance on a national level. But when it comes to an individual, it becomes more complicated, as it is evident in the life of Job, who suffered despite his righteousness. One of the important lessons we must learn is that prosperity does not always look what it seems to be. Instead of equating prosperity with money, power, and influence, that prosperity that God promises sometimes translated into intangible things, that is no material benefits such as spiritual benefits, additional spiritual gifts, a close relationship with God, deeper relationship with our loved ones, peace of mind, fruitful ministry, or eternal rewards. The expectation or belief by many Christians today that following God means that we will not suffer has set up many well-meaning naive Christians for disappointment. We must discover, as Israel did, that sometimes we will see God's reward in temporal, tangible form. But sometimes we will not. As we strive to see through God's eyes, we realize that he will never fail us, and he will faithfully reward the obedience of his people. We could see that when we really go deep into understanding the Bible, that we can know what our Lord Jesus Christ referred to as the truth. Otherwise, we will continue to perceive the truth in our limited human perception. Truth is divine and has different meaning which superficial minds and people are not living in, in this spirit cannot fully understand. When you know the truth, the truth shall set you free. When you have seen Jesus, you have seen the Father, and as the Son dwells in the Father, so do all believers, we dwell in Christ and we know the truth. When you know the truth and you are dwelling in the truth, you will have complete peace, freedom. You will experience some kind of complete liberation from sins because Christ is dwelling inside you. The disciple lived and walked with Jesus, but it took miracles to unlock their spiritual eyes and hearts to the truth. In Matthew 14, 26 to 33. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. 
But straight away, Jesus spoke unto them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, but he was afraid and beginning to sink. And he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately, Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said to him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were coming to the ship, the wind ceased. Then they were those in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. In the case for Christ, what should lead the disciples to be convinced of the divinity of Jesus Christ when the wind died down and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Jesus' words, although impressive, we are sometimes ignored or dismissed. However, the miracles he performed were difficult to discount or dispute. Among Jesus' extraordinary powers was his authority over the natural world. A similar command in Mark 4, 39, reports that with the simple phrase, quiet, be still, Jesus quieted the furious waves. The disciples were stunned and terrified. What kind of a person they wondered possesses such power that even the forces of nature obey him? They knew the answer. Only God himself, although words can be compelling, actions provide powerful evidence to reinforce one's words. In Jesus' case, he made bold claims, and as his disciples could attest, his actions reinforced his authority as the Son of God. You can now understand the confused state of mind of Pontius Pilate and the Jewish religious leaders in not knowing the truth. And how can they know the truth when their hearts were far from God? John the Baptist, the fact that he was the one who baptized Jesus Christ and did recognize him because of the Holy Spirit who descended on Jesus in form of a dove, still needed confirmation from Jesus, whether he is in Isaiah, when he was imprisoned by King Herod. Many theologians have believed this evidence as a reflection of John's lack of confidence in John's own mind. But however, Jesus took the occasion to bear testimony to the great work John had done, emphasizing that he was unwavingly and very, very true. As we read in Luke, 7, 24 to 28, Jesus also revealed to us the truth which was made known to John the Baptist, but denied the religious leaders of his divinity, a prophecy which John also fulfilled in Malachi 3, 1. John alone was entrusted with the mission of preparing the way and baptizing the Savior of the world. He did no miracle but magnificently fulfilled his assignment in bearing testimony to the truth, and that is Jesus Christ. And Jesus said in John 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, but by me. When you know the truth, the truth shall set you free. What is truth? How do we walk in truth? And what are the benefits of walking in truth? The truth is the sum total of Christ. 
the embodiment of all moral virtues, a universal principle which changes not. It was in the beginning. It is now and ever shall be. The truth is Jesus Christ. How do we walk in the truth? So also did King Solomon, did Petrarch, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. They were righteous, just, and steadfast. No matter how righteous and just you may be, you must still remember you are not beyond the temptation of Satan. Because he is not looking for ordinary people, but he is after all those who have been commissioned and anointed for greater responsibilities. And that is why we must continue to pray for our pastors and pray especially for the head of the flock, our general overseer. Satan realizes that his time is now drawing to an end. So he now wants to carry as many righteous men as possible down with him. He is ready to offer you all the riches and wealth of this world just for you to deny your faith in Jesus Christ. Become unto Christ and follow him as we have in so many churches today. It is most disheartening to say that the number of Antichrist is on the increase, not only in America today, but in the whole world. Satan has invaded all churches all over the world and had successfully planted his agents in all churches. And the shameful result is that instead of churches coming together to fight the common enemy, Churches are fractionalizing into so many fragments with diverse self-imposed doctrines which make unification of churches more difficult. Even within the churches, Satan has sown the seed of confusion, seed of distrust, suspicion of others, good motives, and sense of insecurity and fear, which negates progress and creates a state of stagnation in the growth of the ministry. In all churches, the numbers of churchgoers are decreasing daily because Christians prefer spending their time to attend social gatherings, go on picnic, and prefer taking their families to the zoo or amusement park than finding time to come to church. The Bible says in Psalm 84:10. A day in your court is better than a thousand anywhere else. I would rather be a doorkeeper and stand at the threshold in the house of my God than to dwell at ease in the tents of wickedness. When you know the truth, you will no longer crave for anything. You will then be in a better position to understand the following passages in the Bible which to a lot of Christians are still in misery. John 6.35 And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. And then in 1 Timothy 6.68, he said, Now godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing to this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with this we shall be content. And what are the benefits of knowing the truth? John 16, 13 to 15. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority. But whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine, therefore I said that he will take of mine and declare clear it to you. What a great reward. A great benefit when you are walking 
being the truth. If we dwell in a state of perfect peace, contentment, bliss, an absolute sense of security, knowing that the Father will provide all your needs, if even Satan and his agents intimidating and harassing your life, you will not be disturbed. Because you know that the Holy One of Israel will not leave you. It is up to us today to let Christ dwell in us so that his death on the cross and resurrection will not be in vain. Can we bow our head for prayer? Heavenly Father, We thank you for revealing to us the truth which was denied by Jewish religious leaders and Pontius Pilate, who was so near to the truth and yet missed the opportunity to know the truth. Father, we are told to pray in spirit and in truth. Hence, dear Father, we are asking you this afternoon to show us how to pray in spirit and in truth. Teach us the Lord to pray as you will have us to pray. We pray that our human spirits may be led and guided by your Holy Spirit, who by faith in Christ is living in us, so that we may be directed to pray in accordance with your will. We pray that our human spirits may be submitted to your spirit of truth, for we know that he alone can guide us into all truth. As we bow, we bow before you, your throne in humility and thankful praise for this privilege of prayer that has been bestowed on all your children. We pray that you will guide our prayers by the truth of your word so that our prayers and supplication may be in accordance with your will and in line with your desire. Teach us, Lord, to pray in spirit and in truth so that our humble request may become to you a sweet savior and glorify our Father who is in heaven. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. May God bless you.